Lord, we worship you today, Lord God. Lord, you have literally set us free from places that kept us bound. Lord, all those years that we thought we were living in freedom, doing what we wanted to do, but all along we could not stop. We had no freedom, Lord God, to make our own decisions. We had no freedom to walk away from the things that kept us bound. But when you came into our lives, Lord Jesus, Lord, you spoke one word to our hearts. And when we trusted you, you delivered us, you broke our bonds, and you brought us into a freedom that was purchased by you. We did not fight our way into that freedom. We did not work our way into that freedom. We did not change our life to where now we walked in freedom. You gave unto us a precious gift when you gave your life. And you purchased us free from all that would ever keep us in bondage. And Lord, that is why we have a song. That is why we cannot keep our shout in, Lord Jesus. You are too good for us to be quiet, Lord. And we worship you and we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. And thank you, Lord, that we get to sing to you. I don't know about you, but I, if I look behind me, I have a pretty rough past. I come, the Lord Jesus saved me from really, really deep. And when you get set free without your help, you didn't learn to be a better person. You didn't learn to get your stuff together, but a God came into your life and did it all for you. You're going to learn how to sing. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to talk with one another from the Word of God today. I've prayed. The Lord gave me a word for you guys and I believe for your friends and family as well. It's a word that you can carry with you into your journey, but it's also a word of restoration. Now, there may be a season in your marriage where one day you may need that, but there may also be people here and I want to invite you if there is a season of restoration or a new start that in any area of life or your marriage you've been needing. I want to invite you to give your attention and to see if, if God speaks to your heart. When God speaks to your heart, it's very simple. Just something does happen. It's small. But something happens in your heart and it's almost like you're convinced that God is speaking this from His Word directly for you. As if it's made for your situation. When, when the Lord tries to get your attention like that, you just simply say, Lord, I'm going to stop being in control over whatever area is coming to mind. I'm going to ask you, would you teach me to trust you with this? I've always been a man of very small prayers. They've been very short. Sometimes with tears and the Lord had to squeeze me quite hard to get me to pray certain things. But they've always been simple. They've always been small. And the Lord has always answered. Because He doesn't answer because you know how to pray. He doesn't answer because you have a clean life. He answers when people pray in the name of Jesus. That means I trust God hears me because of Jesus, not because I'm good. And it really is that simple. You can do that quietly in your heart right now. You can do it during this word if you feel that God may have a new start for you. But I want to get into the word. The title is The Power of reflection the power of reflection and the reason that we are here today together is ultimately because of Jesus Christ it is Jesus Christ who saved Nicholas it is Jesus Christ who saved Carolina um, a little later I'll share a little bit of a personal journey that I had with them as I saw what the Lord was allowed to do in their life but if you've been close to these people at any time in their life you know they're changed amen Amen. They, they, they were pretty stuck. They were pretty stuck in certain stuff. And um, they didn't set themselves free. Amen. Amen. So that's really why we are here today. But let me read to you John 3, 16 and 17. Verse 17 is my favorite verse in the Bible. But I'll read 16 as well. For God so loved the world. In other translations say, for God loved the world in this way. That he gave his only begotten son... That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him may be saved. 
And so that's ultimately why we're here today. That's why I'm here. I'm from the Netherlands. I would not be here if Jesus had not turned my life absolutely upside down and put me on the other side of the world to tell people that it doesn't matter how messed up you are. If you give your life to Jesus, he'll make something out of it. It really is that simple. That's why we are here together. So let's talk since God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Since God sent his son into the world so that whoever would believe on that name may have eternal life. Let's talk about the power of reflection. What does this mean really for Nick and Carolina and all of us today? Let me start reading about marriage in Ephesians 5. I want to read verse 25 to 33. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. So husbands, or in this way husbands, ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Church, everything that I do not deserve, every single thing that I do not deserve, I received from God through Christ. Let me read it to you again, verse 26 and 27. That he may sanctify, that's what he does, that he may sanctify, that means he cleans your stuff up. That he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That's what he does. I don't deserve it. That he may present her to himself a glorious church. I don't deserve to be part of a glorious people. Amen? Amen. You can say amen right there, church. I do not deserve that. That's what Jesus does. That he may present her, that is the bride of Christ, that is his people, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Everything gets ironed out in your life, in other words, when Jesus gets his hand on it. I don't deserve him doing that for me one bit. But that is what he does, undeservingly, that I should be holy and that I should be without any blemish. Perfect. That's what the word says. Non-deserving. That's what Jesus did for me. And then the word says, in this way, husband, husbands are to love their wives. Church, you can give someone what they do not deserve if you are willing to forgive. Especially when we're talking about marriage today. If you are willing to always forgive your spouse, there's never a condition as this is one too far. This is one too many. This is too big, too thick, too widespread. You are always willing to take on an attitude of forgiveness. You can always give somebody what they don't deserve. You take a grudge with somebody, you don't want them to get anymore what they don't deserve. You, go, you don't deserve that. You, th you think you can get away with this stuff. I don't want this. And you stop reflecting towards others and first of all towards your spouse. You stop reflecting what Jesus did for you. You stop reflecting that you received all that stuff for free, undeserving from God, when, when you were honestly the problem. And you received it all. You deserved nothing from what you got. And we are called as husbands to have that attitude, that heart, and those kind of works to, I see you, Maria. You are welcome in this wedding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have to take on an attitude of forgiveness in order to continue to give out what somebody does not deserve. Now, Nick and Carolina, you've been practicing this. Amen. Because the first little bit you thought, 
Carolina that Nick was perfect. There's still days that you think that for a little moment, but and other way around too. And then you begin to do a little bit of life together and you realize it's not the case. They still have mistakes. And Jesus gave them that perfect gift. They're perfect in the eyes of the Lord. But when you begin to do life with somebody, you realize, well, they're different than I am. Amen? Amen. That's when we have to give one another things the other person does not deserve. That's easy right now. Right now, it's easy to do it. But when you walk in the power of reflection, something very special happens to marriage. We're going to see it in just a little bit. Let me read to you, Carolina, and to all of the women here, verse 33, the part of the woman. is very special because the woman only really has one part. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular in this way love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's the only thing here mentioned. For the wife to do, to respect her husband. Everything else, all those undeserved gifts that Christ gives, they're all kind of a burden on the husband to constantly distribute towards our wife. The wife is really invited to respect the husband. And a, and a woman giving respect to her husband is probably one of the most humbling tools that you have, Carolina. When a woman gives respect to her husband, especially when it is an undeserved gift, when he does not deserve it, it is one of the most powerful, humbling tools that the Lord has placed in your arsenal to help us get back on our knees, to help us get back to the Lord, to help us take back on an attitude of forgiveness when we need to so that we continue to give undeserved gifts to first of all our wife and then secondly to all of those around us. When a woman chooses forgiveness and then gives the undeserving gift of respect, it makes us giving men. You have a lot of power over your husband. And you can make him into a man that is able to follow Jesus and build that power of reflection over that marriage that you guys are going to get into. Here is what the Lord put on my heart for all of us. If we are willing to sacrifice in order to forgive our spouse, then there's going to be power in our marriage. That is what Jesus did. Jesus had to make the ultimate sacrifice, give himself on behalf of his bride, his people. That's the, the parable he makes, a bride and a husband as the church and Jesus Christ. He explains it that way, the relationship. And he gave his life. I always like to say, Jesus rather died than ever blame his bride. That's the kind of love that he took on. And when we as husbands begin to learn one step at a time to rather die than to ever blame our bride, we begin to give undeserving gifts. We begin to reflect what Jesus has done for us. And we begin to spread that out, first of all, into our family. And then that will become the fruit of our family into the lives that all uh, that are all around us. And when you are willing to sacrifice to forgive, and you will have to, hurt is real. And when unexpected things happen or situations happen or people say things when they are upset, they can really wound our hearts to such an extent that we don't even feel the hurt anymore. Our hearts have now been locked up. And we can say things to one another and just snare something back and move on the next day as if nothing ever happened. But when we are willing to sacrifice to forgive, when we are willing to say, that really, really wounded me and hurt me. You really went too far. But I choose forgiveness because God chose forgiveness for you. If God was willing to die for you, who am I to keep you guilty? I'm willing to forgive. If you are willing to sacrifice to forgive, your spouse you will always be able to keep building your relationship it'll never stay the same one year in a row it will always be a growing a deepening a more and more beautiful relationship and then all of a sudden a power begins to arise over that marriage and it begins to show the world all those that are around us what God has done it begins to reflect it very clearly that God has done something so undeserving that we are now being enabled, that we are now being willing to give such undeserved gifts away all the time. It begins to show the people that are close to us and around us, this is not normal. 
You, why do you not defend yourself? Why don't you have your part? Why don't you do give and take like the world does? Why is it only giving with you? How is that possible? Why don't you guys have a give and take relationship? And that is when a couple that is governed by the Holy Spirit, they can simply say, I get my stuff from somewhere else. I can give because I constantly receive from my Lord. I go to Him. I talk with Him simply in prayer. I worship Him. I ex my expectations are on Him. My, my defense comes from Him. My protection comes from Him. My provision comes from Him. He's the one I run to so that I can be a giving man, a giving woman in my relationship. He forgives. He's the only one, by the way, through whose name you can be forgiven. It becomes a marriage that has the power to show this world what God has done. When you have a marriage that is fake it is portrayed well when everyone is watching but it is different at home god never grants power to that marriage to reflect and to cause people to begin to believe that they can be forgiven because of this jesus now you may share the gospel but you can never change your marriage behind the front door from the one that you live in front of people you have a god that is too powerful too present too willing for you to, to play nice. And so I want to encourage you to always simply run to Him. Put your expectations on Him. He'll change everything that needs changing. You'll never have to be a pretender. You can live a life, a marriage that has the power to show people. God can do this. God can make this world. And, and that is what He does so that there may be hope in this world. That there may be hope for all of those that are watching. You may not have an opportunity all the time. To share the gospel maybe the way you would like to with a lot of people. But when they begin to see that you are a person, a man or woman that can just give undeserved gifts always. And you, it, you, ne you don't wear out. Somebody cannot wear you out. Sooner or later somebody's going to say this is not normal. How is this possible? How are you such a giving person? How come that you keep going? How come this marriage is just flourishing? Here is the gospel for marriage. Here's the good news for your marriage, Nicholas and Carolina and all of us. Isaiah 54 verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. You and I have to believe God at His word. We have to believe God for His gospel. This is the hope for our marriages. There is no, that's the promise. All the promises are yes and amen in Christ. There is no weapon formed against you who have believed in Jesus. There's no weapon formed against you that will ever prosper. Now many weapons will be formed against your marriage. Many weapons will be shaped, but the Word tells us that none of those weapons that will be formed and will be shaped, custom-made, tailor-made just for your marriage to fight against it, the Word tells us none of them will prosper. The problem is that every weapon that Satan fashions against marriage, the way God designed it, every single weapon has the same message. Every single weapon has the same message. Is this. This weapon will work. This mistake is one too far. This is unforgivable. You can now not forgive and continue to give undeserved gifts. There will come a weapon up that says this is one too far. You guys can just not understand each other. This weapon is going to prosper in this marriage. A weapon will come up and says this struggle cannot be overcome. And this struggle gives you the reason and the allowance to just begin to start separating and do your own thing, tolerate one another, live in the same house, but live your own life. Weapons will be formed and they have a message. They say, this weapon God overlooked. This weapon is able to prosper against your marriage. This weapon is able to keep you from growing in your marriage. This weapon will prosper in your life. And we have to believe God because God says 
No weapon formed against you will prosper and no one can raise their tongue in judgment against you. You shall condemn them. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me. If that doesn't get you excited, nothing will. I'm going to clap right there. I'm going to wake you up a little bit. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. I want to look with you at King Hezekiah. Because he gives a great example of what that means in our life. I want to read to you verse 10, 11, and 14 of 2 Kings chapter 19. Starting in verse 10. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given in the hand of the king of Assyria. Look! You have heard what all the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them and you shall be delivered. That's that message. There's, that's that message that says now there's a weapon formed. Nobody can overcome it. There's a weapon formed. You've seen mar many marriages fall to it. There's a weapon formed. You have seen many people separated because of it. There's a weapon formed. It is going to make it more difficult than it's ever been in any generation. There's a, and they send this message to Hezekiah. We are an enemy. We have weapons. The, everybody else falls under us. Who do you think you are that you are going to stand? Don't let your God deceive you. Believe us. Don't let your God deceive you. We have weapons that are able to do this. And you're going to feel like that sometimes in marriage. That message is going to come. It can take many shapes. But it's the message that says, this one, I don't know if there's still a way forward. I don't know if there's going to be a breakthrough here. I don't know if there's going to be victory here. I don't know if this is going to be built up or be broken down. Those moments come. And then we read verse 14. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. What did he do? Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. That's what Hezekiah did. He took it to the house of the Lord, wherever he worshipped, wherever he prayed. He took it right there and he showed the Lord, Lord, look at their threats. Lord, look at the weapons. Lord, you told me that no weapon formed against me would prosper. Look what they're coming up with. Look what they're now putting in my mind. Look what the enemy is trying to make me believe about my journey. Look what the enemy is trying to make me believe about me as an individual. Look what the enemy is trying to make me believe about my spouse. Look what the enemy is trying to make me believe about my marriage. God, I'm going to have a, a moment where I turn back to the power of reflection. I trust you. I'm going to believe you at your word. I'm going to choose to keep on forgiving. I'm going to choose to keep on giving undeserved gifts gifts and I'm going to keep walking in the power of reflection. Church, there is power in walking out the reflection of the cross. There's a power that will come upon your marriage that will be able to build it no matter the kind of heavy weather that your life may get in because that is real. Very difficult things will come your way in your life. But if you are deciding to keep on forgiving and you decide to keep on giving away undeserved gifts, that means now he did it again. Now it's undeserving. I'm going to choose to give it anyway. Or now she did it again. And now it's undeserving. I'm, I'm going to choose to be defined by God and give anyway. You're going to bring a power upon your marriage that will cause it to flourish no matter what comes your way. You reflect what God has done for you. To first towards your spouse and then towards your generation. The power will be there to build a marriage. There will be the power to protect a marriage. And there will be power to prosper your marriage no matter what comes your way. You will prosper in your marriage if you simply choose to believe God. And you do not ever give in to those threats of the enemy that there's a weapon out there that is able to prosper against you as a couple, against you as an individual. Do you understand that God decided you were worth for His Son to die in your place? 
If that is God's heart towards you, he's not going to let a weapon exist out there that somehow is able to overcome you as a person or destroy your marriage that he designed and he gave it to you. Let me read to you a very difficult verse, Hebrews 13, verse 4. Some translations put make sure in front of this verse. Make sure that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers God will judge to keep marriage in honor remember what I said about the behind behind the front door to have that marriage display the honor of God behind the front door in front of the front door anywhere anytime this is a hard thing and to keep the marriage bed undefiled, nobody has to tell you, that is very hard. A lot of people fail in that area. It is a hard saying until you realize that what Jesus has done on the cross has put me in a place where God says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The place that God has brought you and I because of the cross is so safe. That God would entrust a marriage that you and I could never do right. He entrusted it to us. And he said, I'm going to deal with all of the weapons that are formed against you. I'm going to deal with your weakness. I'm going to give you of my spirit. There's going to be power to walk it out. But believe to reflect. Believe what God has said. Believe what God has done. Because marriage is a plan that is ordained by God to succeed. If you are in a place, I know you guys are not there, but if you are in a place today, whether you're with us online, I know many people are with us online. If you are online, if you are in a place or in person here, you're in a place where you say, I, I don't feel like my marriage is flourishing. You may have not shared that with your spouse, but you may feel in your heart you're a little concerned. That somehow you've seen something of a weapon against the marriage that seems or feels intimidating a little bit. And you say, I don't really feel that I'm flourishing. This is the truth of God over your life. Marriage was never your plan. That is God's plan and it is ordained by God to succeed. You're on a, a journey that God says is going to be a success. You're not on a journey that is very dangerous, doomed to fail, only so many marriages make it. All of that is just weapons screaming. No, no, no. There is weapons that will prosper against you. No, no, no. There is things that God has overlooked and forgotten. It's not true. God set you on a plan that he ordained to be successful. And God always makes a way forward. Nick and Carolina, never forget this. God always makes a way forward. When we forgive, we're willing to reflect. We're willing to give undeserved gifts. And we're willing to humble ourselves in prayer. God will always make a way. He's way maker. You ever get to a place in your life, for any of us, you ever get in a place where you say there's no way forward, that's testimony time right there. There's no way forward. You bring that thing to the Lord and He will make a way and make you a demonstration of what He can do. If you would stand with me for a moment, I want to pray with you before we continue into the ceremony. And I want to pray with you very simply. You can pray with me quietly in your heart. And I simply want to pray with you, whether you are not married or you are married, this applies to you always. And it's a simple prayer. I'm going to pray it with you. This is what it says. Lord, would you teach my heart that there's always a way forward? And some of us need to learn that for the first time. Some of us need to learn it again. Lord, would you teach it to my heart that there is always a way forward, that there's no weapon, doesn't exist that will prosper against us. Lord, we come before you as a people. And Lord, we come from so many backgrounds, Lord Jesus. And somehow, Lord God, you worked out how to get us together today, Lord God. You saved my friend Nick, Lord God. You saved Carolina. You changed their life around. And somehow, we are all here today, Lord God. Lord, I pray, together with every person here and online, Lord God, Lord, would you teach my heart that there is always a way forward with you. 
Lord, would you teach our hearts that there is never a lost case, a lost cause, or a lost marriage. Lord, would you teach my heart that there is always a way forward. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs>